So must have been 23, 24, something like that, a long time ago. Uh, I show up at this 20-somethings event in Dallas, Texas, mega church. All the churches are mega there. And uh, some pastor's getting ready to come up on the stage and speak. I'd never heard of him, but my friend leans over. He's like, you should check this guy out. I'm like, all right. And then this uh, young Asian-American pastor gets up on the stage. I think his name was um, Francis Chan. So uh, There's a quote attributed to John Wesley. Don't know if John Wesley actually said this, but the story goes, some woman comes up to John Wesley and says, um, why does everyone come after you? Why, why is everyone coming out to hear your preaching? And he supposedly answered, I set myself on fire and people come out to watch me burn. That's what Francis Chan did that night. He didn't so much preach as just set himself on fire and set us all on fire with his passion. He told story after story from the book of Acts, Peter healing the lame man, Christians selling everything they had, uh, people being healed by Paul's handkerchief, uh, getting into fistfights with demon-possessed people, riots in Ephesus. And then after each and every story, he would stop and say, why don't our lives look like that? Why doesn't the church in America look like that? Only he was a little more passionate when he said it. And it was powerful. I was shaken. And so that night, thousands of 20-somethings left the mega church burning with a discontent over the way their lives were, over the way the church was, and I was one of them. So then I took this like raging discontent back to the church I was serving in. I wanted to live the book of Acts, but I found that my church ministry looked um, less like riots in the street and more like deacon meetings where we discussed like the HVAC insurance, you know, things like that. It looked less like God shaking the room in the middle of a prayer meeting and more like elderly women who were committed to prayer in their prayer closet and would pray decade after decade, sometimes decades before God would answer. It looked less like people getting healed by handkerchiefs and more like endless meetings at hospitals. It looked less like fistfights with demon-possessed people and more like just weighty, slow, sobering meetings with teens who were threatening suicide. Dads who are just coming apart, ruining their lives. Moms who are dealing with grief. And that was my church experience. Now, you could cherry pick. If you go back over the last 20 years, my, my pastoral experience, you could cherry pick stories. There's uh, the time I met with the, the witch doctor in Cambodia who became a Christ follower. There's the story about us having the prayer meeting after the, the guy was shot and killed right in front of our church office. So we called this prayer meeting for the, and huge groups from the community came out who would never step into church. And we, there have been miraculous healings, conversions, moments when God has interrupted our plans and our lives, but those aren't normal. Uh, most of church life, most of my life is common, quiet, and rather boring. Um. It runs more on like faithfulness and discipline than on passion. Most of my life looks like those first 30 years of Jesus, those years that you hear nothing about, than the last three years. And so for years, I struggled with this reality of like the difference between my life and the book of Acts. Like throughout the scriptures, not just in Acts, but throughout the scriptures, you hear these vast, immense, spectacular stories of God moving, God working, the story of God, this huge, sweeping, vast thing that we're called into. But in my life, my story is small and limited, not so spectacular. And in the back of that, I could hear Francis Chan's voice. Why doesn't my life look like that? Why doesn't our church look like that? Now, looking back, I think Chan had a really good aim. I think he was just trying to say, hey, don't get comfortable with this consumeristic American mentality of the good life. Don't, don't define your life that way. Don't be comfortable with that. I think that's good. But his message had the unintended consequence of suggesting that a life that doesn't look like one of the epic stories in the book of Acts was somehow less, somehow wrong, somehow off. The unintended consequence was that many of us were haunted with this feeling 
that the story of God, like the story we find in the scriptures, is distant, different, disconnected from my life, from reality, from the life that we live day in and day out. And it left me asking the question, how do I find my place in the story of God? And I think a lot of you can probably relate. Now, as it turns out, um, this struggle, this distance between the story of God and my life, like how do these two fit, it doesn't originate with Francis Chan in the early 2000s. And believe it or not, you find this exact same struggle as early as the Bronze Age. So something happened in the mid-second um, millennium B.C. in the Bronze Age. Uh, something happened that would forever change the world. If you study the ancient Near Eastern literature, artifacts from predating that period, you find that when you look at human history, history, like what happened among humans, you will find lists. History amounts to lists. There are a list of kings who ruled, list of towns conquered, list of people. History is captured in lists. Like random events, you just list them. But if you want to make sense of it, if you want to see the arc of it, if you want to see the meaning behind those lists, like what's going on in the world, you would go not to history, not to what happens among humans, you would go to what we would call myth, the stories about gods. They have stories. They don't have lists. They have stories. So Marduk, Narek, Ra, Baal, Baal fighting Tiamat, the, the battle of the gods. These are the stories of the Babylonians, the Hittites, the Egyptians, the Canaanites, pretty much every group across the ancient Near East. Myths were the stories that made sense of life. So your life, real life, your working, eating, commuting, grocery shopping, TV watching lives, whatever you do lives, that's just a list of random things that happen in your life. It, it doesn't, it, they're not necessarily connected, but if you want a story or meaning in the world, it doesn't have to do with you. It has to do with the gods. It's outside of human actions. But then something happens in the mid to late second millennium BC. A god shows up that this world has never heard before. In fact, when he shows up, a pharaoh, the richest, most powerful person in the world at the time, says, who is Yahweh? I don't know Yahweh. Exodus chapter 5. This God named Yahweh shows up in human history. Not, not just in a myth. Not just a story we make up about the gods, but he actually shows up in human history. Yahweh shows up spectacularly in, in these plagues, parting the Red Sea, judging the gods of Egypt, humiliating Pharaoh. The world sees it. It's undeniable. The whole world sees this. The word gets out that the stuff of myths, of gods battling one another, of plagues, of seas being cut into, this is happening in our lives, in human history, uh, among humans. And so Yahweh, he... He enters into our story and he leads this group of the Israelites out of Egypt and he takes them to this place, to Mount Sinai. And there at Mount Sinai, he descends upon the mountain in fire and something happens that will forever change the world. We read about it in Exodus chapter 19. Then Moses went up to God and the Lord, Yahweh, called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Carried you on eagle's wings. Remember that. You'll need that in a couple weeks. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, my relationship, this relationship we're forming right now, then out of all the peoples, you will be my treasure possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. If you've been at our church any amount of time, you know, I go back to this text a lot. Why? Because this is a seminal moment. This is the moment when God enters into human history and says, now I'm joining my story with your story in something we call a covenant. I, I'm marrying myself to you. I will be your God. You will be my people. Uh, we're going to do this together. This is so monumental that at the time, everyone who showed up there, whoever was the father of the household, their family name became the name of that father. Like everyone, this is the start of your family. This is the moment that redefines everyone. Your family life, your history starts today here. Why? Because at this mountain, at this moment, God enters into our lives. He joins his story, the stuff of of myths, the stuff of gods, the meaning of the world with this random list of random things that are happening in your life. They're no longer random. Now they're married to the God of the universe. 
In fact, what follows in, in the following pages is that for the first time ever, God is in my life. He literally moves into the middle of their camp and sets up, and now he takes the central position in their working, eating, commuting, grocery shopping, TV watching lives. He's in the very middle of all, he's in all that stuff, the little details, the big stuff. The, the, my personal history and the history of God are now married, they're one. I find that God is in my story, or rather, I find myself caught up in his story. So the ancient Near Eastern expert, Edward Campbell, points out that this new relationship with God, this thing we call covenant, this new identity as the people of God, births a new form of literature, a form that we've never seen before. Suddenly, history is no longer just a list. It's a story. It has a plot. This is new. The Bible translator, Eugene Peterson, helpfully explains this. It's worth quoting. He writes this, from that time on, from Mount Sinai on, when Israel wrote about God, she wrote history. Among other peoples in the ancient world, there was nothing comparable. Israel's neighbors wrote down historical data, reigns of kings, list of cities conquered in battle, treaty obligations, business transactions, but none of them wrote history. Narratives in which the decisions of people and the responses they lived, um, lived were told in relation to the decisions of God and his actions. The two are now married. The Hebrews were the world's first historians. So this seismic shift takes place at Mount Sinai. God shows up. We're forever changed. Our lives are caught up with him. Our history is no longer just a random list of events, but it means something. It's headed somewhere. It's part of God's story. It now has ultimate meaning. Everything is tied to ultimate meaning. Our stories and God's stories are now enmeshed, but then something happens within a generation or two. We run into a problem. You see, you and I, we weren't at Mount Sinai. I don't know about you, I haven't seen any um, frogs like dropping from the sky or water turning to blood or uh, any, any seas being parted in half lately. I haven't seen God descend upon a mountain in fire. I haven't felt the earth shake like that. I haven't heard the voice of God. Not like that. And so there's this question like, how does my story fit into that? How, how uh, you start to immediately start to grow this distance. It feels distant from us and our lives tend to be less dramatic most of us cannot relate to Moses most of us do not witness seas being part of our lives so the ancient Jews they they start a tradition at first blush it seems um well it seems like nonsense this is what they do they say okay every year when we celebrate Pentecost weeks same thing this, this festival where we're supposed to go in the middle of the summer we're supposed to go to Jerusalem and celebrate before God we're supposed to celebrate Mount Sinai. That's what you celebrate at the Feast of Pentecost. We're going to celebrate God showing up, changing the world forever, entering into history, entering into a covenant with us, giving us his law. That's what we celebrate at Pentecost. And now when we do that, what's going to happen is in the midst of this vast epic story about what God has done in the past and how he shook the earth, in the middle of that, we're going to stop everything, call a time out, and we're going to read the book of Ruth. We don't know how ancient this is, but we know it's ancient. My, my rabbi friend in New York, he suggests that it comes from Second, Second Temple Judaism, which would be the time of Jesus. So it's ancient. So for thousands of years, Jews said, when we talk about Mount Sinai, we're going to, in the middle of all that, when we're talking about this vast epic story of God, we're going to pause everything, and we're going to read the book of Ruth. Now, if you know anything about the book of Ruth, you know this is odd. Ruth is a short story about like this impoverished elderly widow and her Moabite daughter-in-law who are like searching for food and a husband. There are no miracles, no prophets, no fire descending, no battle of the gods, no great kings, nothing flashy about the story. It's just a very common story from Bronze Age. And you say, like, what are these rabbis thinking? Like, what does this story, this little story, have to do with this big, vast story? What do these normal, forgettable people have to do with this vast, epic, immense story of God? And that, that is the question. So when we ask, how do I fit into the story of God? Well, how do normal, broken, boring people like Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, people like me, how do we fit into this vast, epic, immense story of God? When we ask that question in classic God style, he doesn't give us a direct answer. He tells us a story. 
Ruth, chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So this is the setup. In the days when the judges ruled, this would be from the time when, when the Israelites first entered into the promised land under Joshua, just after that period, until before the monarchy. This is the rise of like Saul and David became kings. In that period, there's this time called the period of the judges, which is graphically described in the book of Judges, and it is a time marked by sheer and utter chaos. If you're here when I preach through the book of Judges, you know that most of it is rated R. It's the time that they were caught in this self-destructive cycle where like they would be at peace for a little while and as soon as they got a little bit of space in their lives they would immediately forget about God, ignore God, and then drift off into sin. I don't know if any of you can relate. And then because of their own sins they would suffer and suffer and it would get bad. They, they would eventually be oppressed. They would be crushed by the weight of their own sin until so they came to a point of complete and utter repentance, God would have pity on them. He would send in a judge, a deliverer, a savior for them who would save them out of that, who would usher in a period of peace until so they got a little bit of space in their lives and then they'd forget about God again. And then they'd sin. And they went on, the, if, if, you, if you were here, you know that the book of Judges isn't just a cycle of sin. It's a death spiral of sin. They go through this, you know, peace to sin to suffering to repentance. They go through this cycle again and again and again until six times, until it just smashes at the bottom. At, at the last couple of chapters are just almost unreadable. I mean, it's an era of lies, rape, abuse, terror, political upheaval, gross idolatry by the priests. And the book ends with this story about a man who's, um, it, it, it's, it's echoing the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. This man whose concubine gets raped until she gets killed. She, she's a victim of sexual violence. And when he sees this, he takes her body, he hacks it up into pieces and sends the body parts to all the uh, other 11 tribes and says, this is what the Benjamites have done. And he declares war on them. And then God's people are killing God's people. And it collapses into this death, violence, abuse, dehumanization. And then the point of the whole thing is God's people are now worse than the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what the story is about. And there's this haunting refrain over and over in these final chapters. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. They had their own truth. And that's when this story is taking place. It is terrible. And that's the setting of this book. During that time, there was a famine, it says. A famine suggests um, Leviticus chapter 26. It could just be a famine. It could just be something happened. But it's probably not in this context. It should be understood as a judgment of God, as, as part of the thing that God's using to turn them back to themselves, uh, to him. In those days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Now there's a little bit of humor here. Um, the word for few, food in Hebrew is bread. And then Bethlehem means bet lechem, means house of bread. There was no bread in the house of bread. So he's got to go. So they're going to go to Moab. Here's a Google map of it. Uh, you have Bethlehem on, on the left-hand side here, uh, western side of the Dead Sea. And just on the other side is this region of Moab. If you zoom in a little with Google Maps, you can see that it's a 33-hour walk. You know, you know right there? You could walk it. So Moab's just on the other side of the Dead Sea. Um, but it's not just geographically close. It's actually, um, there's all kinds of... Uh, connections between Moab and the ancient Israelites. In, in the Old Testament, this, this idea of going to Moab, um, it doesn't sound promising. It sounds like a curse, like something you'd say to someone like, you can go to Moab. Huh? <laughs> so the Moabites, they are despised, nasty people. I mean, no Israelite would want to ever go there unless they were absolutely desperate. So here's what I mean. We're going to have to do this. I apologize in advance. A brief history of Moab. All right, it starts Genesis chapter 19. Lot and his, his wife and daughters, they're running out of, out of Sodom and Gomorrah as like fires raining down from heaven, you know? The whole place is getting destroyed. Lot's wife looks back 
You know the story? Turns into a pillar of salt. And then here is Lot and his two daughters. And his two daughters look at each other and like, every possible husband we could marry just got killed. <laughs> what are we going to do? And one of them is like, I know what we'll do. We'll get dad drunk. And what comes out of that drunken, incestuous, ugh, is a son named Moab and a son named ben the father of the Moabites and the Ammonites. Fast forward to Numbers chapter uh, 22. The Israelites had just got out of Egypt. They're they're in the wilderness, and they want to go to the promised land. They're like, they come to Moab, and they're like, hey, we just want to pass through your land so we can get to the promised land. Can we just have safe passage? We don't want anything from you. We just want to pass through. And the Moabites are like, no. They refuse them. In fact, they, they, they don't just say no. They send a prophet to go try and curse the Israelites. The plan ends up backfiring. But... Numbers chapter 25, when they say, oh, okay, we can't curse them and we can't beat them in war, so here's what we'll do. We will seduce them. Now, this story becomes key to understanding the book of Ruth. The Moabite women come to seduce, intentionally seduce the Israelite men, and not just sexually, spiritually. They don't just get them to go to bed with them. They get them to go to bed with their gods. And then enter the story of Phineas. So, in the middle of this, Moses is like, what are you guys doing? You're being seduced to these other gods by these Moabite women. Stop it. And just in in the middle of that, we see this Israelite man walk into a tent with a Moabite woman. And so Phinehas, the priest, goes out, picks up his spear, walks into the tent, and then the word of the Lord says, and I quote, he drove the spear into both of them, right through the Israelite man, into the woman's stomach. Numbers 25, 8, the word of the Lord to you today. And then you fast forward uh, just a handful of years. That they're, they're at the end of the desert wanderings. It's Deuteronomy chapter 23. And Moses is preaching his final sermon just before he's going to die. And the Israelites are going to go into the promised land. And he says, hey, I have one closing word for you just about the, the Ammonites and the Moabites. I want you to hear this. No Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even in the 10th generation. For 10 generations. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live. Never do any business with them. Do not be friends with them. Do not be around them. Clear? In Judges chapter 3, close to, close in proximity to the time period of Ruth, in just a little after that, um, Judges chapter 3, Eglon, king of Moab, he was a very fat man, the text says. I don't know. When the Bible says you're fat, I guess you're fat. <laughs> and, and he oppressed the Israelites until Jephthah, a left-handed man, hid a dagger and then snuck into Eglon's throne room and he shoved the dagger into his stomach until the very handle itself came inside of his belly, it says. Again, the book of Judges. How edifying is that? The only reason an Israelite would ever go to Moab is if they were utterly desperate. And if going to Moab isn't bad enough, um, check out these names, verse 2. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were uh, Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Okay, so um, Elimelech and Naomi, we're, we're pretty sure these names are what you call irony. Uh, Elimelech means uh, God is my king. And yet he's leaving, he lives in a time when, when nobody's the king and they're just they're le- heading into a godless region called Moab. And Naomi means pleasant and we're going to discover that she's anything but. And then they have two sons whom they promptly name Sickness and Hospice. I'm not joking. That's literally how their names translate. Uh, the, the first one literally means sickness, and the second one it could mean ending or mortality or this guy's going to die soon. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. They married Moabite women. This sentence is wrong at so many levels. 
So the first thing is you ask, like, have you forgotten Numbers chapter 25? Moabite women seduce you, and it ends with Phineas spearing you to the ground. Have you forgotten? And then Deuteronomy 23, what part of don't be friends with them forever do you not understand? <laughs> but if, but that, that doesn't quite capture it. It doesn't, the literal translation of this text doesn't say they married Moabite women. That's what they did. But it literally translates, they abducted or seized Moabite women. It's the same word used in Judges chapter 21 to describe this scene where um, the Benjamites, all their wives have been killed in war. All of them. All the women were dead. So they're like, oh no, what are we going to do for our brothers, the Benjamites? They have no wives and they have no way to carry on their tribe. I know what we'll do. There's a big party in Shiloh when all the virgins, all the young women, go out into the vineyards and they dance. Well, while they do that, you men, get ready. And you go, grab one for yourself. Drag her home. That's how you're going to get a wife. You abduct one. You seize one. Here's a um, picture, a famous picture. Of it. I had to edit it a little for you. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, how did you two meet? Oh, that, so romantic. <laughs> After they had lived there about 10 years. Get this, the decades passed. Both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Sickness and hospice, I can't say I didn't see that one coming. But think about Naomi, really. She is cursed. She's running from a famine. Uh, she's living in God-forsaken Moab. Her husband dies. Both of her sons marry Moabite women. Moabite women, and then they clearly are having problems because for 10 years, they're childless. In the ancient Near East, people didn't wait to have kids. That's not a thing. Do you understand? If they were childless for 10 years, there was a problem. And then both of her sons die. So for a decade of her life, she's had a life marked by hunger, death, grief, unfulfilled desire, and now two more funerals. So in the ancient Near East, to be a widow with no sons, to have no men in your life, is to be utterly voiceless, completely helpless, to have no future. Uh, Naomi lives in a violent, vicious world with no way of making money, no way of protecting herself, nothing except two Moabite daughter-in-laws. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food, bread for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them goodbye. So Naomi sends them away with his blessing. May the Lord grant you kindness. May he grant you rest. May he give you another husband. Um, there's, a, there's a word here that, that is the first time it comes up in the book of Ruth, but it's woven throughout the book of Ruth and woven throughout the whole Old Testament. In fact, in some ways, this word holds the Old Testament together. It is a word that can't be understood um, just on the outside. It, it can only be understood in relationship with God. It is a covenant word. It's a word that only happens when you give your life to God, when you're in that relationship with God. It's the word hesed. It's translated kindness in this text. But kindness is only gives you a little, little glimpse of what hesed means. It's usually translated in compound words like loving kindness or loyal love or covenant faithfulness or something like that. Daniel Block, an Old Testament scholar, helps, helpfully describes it this way. He says, hesed cannot be translated with one English word. It is a covenant term. It's a term that is, 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 is in itself, must be in relationship with God. It's a covenant term wrapping up in itself all the positive attributes of God. Love, covenant, faithfulness, mercy, grace, kindness, loyalty. It is a faithfulness that risks. It is a love that declares, I am not going anywhere. 
It is a, a, an unexpected grace that catches us at our worst and loves us. Right then, at our worst, loves us and transforms us through that. Naomi prays that the Lord would show them hesed. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there were still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. So Naomi is referring to Leverite marriage. So here's the context. Imagine Bronze Age. You're, you see this, there's an Israelite guy, young Israelite guy. He goes and abducts for himself a nice Moabite wife. And then uh, they don't have any kids yet, and he dies. What's going to happen to his bride? What happens to the widow? Well, in that culture, not just in that culture, but across the ancient Near East, there was a social welfare system called Leverite marriage. You can read about it in Deuteronomy chapter 25. And the idea is that the the next of kin, either the brother or the next male relative, would then step in and marry that woman, that widow, in order to take care of her. Now, here's here's the thing, though. He doesn't just get her as a wife. He's stepping in. He's in the place of the husband who died. So, While he has to pay for her and pay for her kids, he himself doesn't get any of the benefits. He doesn't get any of the the inheritance that the husband had. So it is a very costly way for whoever steps in that place has to care for him, and it's very costly. It's actually a a huge act of grace. Naomi's saying, though, this isn't going to happen. Do you see how old I am? I'm not going to have any more sons. You two need to head home because here's your options right now. If you, if you don't find, if for a young woman in that position, you have, here's a few options. You could beg. Ruth does that later. You could sell yourself into slavery. You could become a prostitute. Many did. Or you could go home to daddy and start collecting cats. She's saying, you need, it's time to go home. It's time to go home. You don't want to follow me where I'm... The Lord's hand is against me. You don't want to go where I'm going to go. At this, they wept aloud again. They realized she's right. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Clung to her. It's, um, it's the same word, Genesis chapter 2, where it talks about marriage. A husband will leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. Same word. She clung to her in this covenantal relationship. I am not going anywhere. Look, said Naomi, your your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. And then Ruth, she hasn't spoken yet, and she'll say very little in this book. But when she speaks, it's breathtaking. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Now Ruth, she she might be a hated Moabitess. She might be a woman in a man's world. She, she might have had no say in her marriage. She was abducted. She may be cursed and impoverished and powerless. But she gets it. This is hesed. This is faithfulness that risks. This is a love that declares, I am not going anywhere. This is an unexpected grace. And here's the question that is going to just be planted in this text. Does it make any difference? Does that kind of covenantal love, that kind of faithfulness, that kind of like, I am not going anywhere, when when that enters into a story of curse, 
of death, of grief, of loss, does it really make a difference? Like, what happens when, when Hesed enters into that kind of story? And the answer is, well, what happens? Well, first, nothing. Nothing happens. Except that now Naomi does not have to walk that road alone. And that's something. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Her name means pleasant, remember? Can this be pleasant? Like, I remember the pleasant woman who left. She's unrecognizable at this point. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life bitter. There's the two name changes. She says, my name is not Naomi. It's not pleasant. It's Mara. That's the Hebrew word for bitter. I'm bitter. That's who I am. And she doesn't call the Lord by his covenantal name, by that name that we know in relationship, Yahweh. She calls him the Almighty. If you lived in the 1980s and know Amy Grant, you might know this word. It's El Shaddai. Sorry, kids. Famous song, 1980s. Google it sometime. Uh, Hebrew scholars debate this meaning It almost certainly refers to God as the Almighty, as all-powerful. Therefore, we translate it usually in most of our texts as the Almighty. But it literally means like maybe God of the mountains or God of the breasts. We're not quite sure. It literally translates God of the twin peaks. You can see? Uh Amy Grant probably did not know that when she sang her song. Um, It could be a reference to God being enthroned above all, like in the council all, everything called or claiming to be gods, they all sit under him. That would be God of the mountains. Or it could be, here, here, I know this is going to be tricky, but in the ancient Near East, breasts weren't just ornamental guys. They were actually a source of life. They kept you alive. And so God, who, who brings you in close, the God who nurtures you at his breast, that's the image. It could mean either. We're not quite sure which could mean both but she says Shaddai has made my life bitter I went away full but the Lord Yahweh brought me back empty why call me Naomi the Lord Yahweh has afflicted me the almighty Shaddai has brought misfortune upon me do you hear the fourfold complaint here Shaddai has made my life very bitter Yahweh has brought me back empty Yahweh has afflicted me Shaddai has brought misfortune upon me and so ends act one It is a terrible place to stop. (laughs) I mean, nothing's resolved here. Life is terrible. Naomi's blaming God. Life is objectively bad, cursed. And we could skip ahead and try and ease the tension a little bit, but I don't think I'm going to. Naomi had to sit in this for over a decade. You can handle a week or two. So I don't want to add to this. It's bad now, but it's going to get better because that's not what Naomi needs to hear. She needs someone to just be with her, someone to walk with her, someone to suffer with her, not to judge her, not to tell her it's going to be okay. And that, that is not easy. It's not easy for Naomi. It's not easy for us. But it's times like this when Hesed, said, I am not going anywhere, starts to mean something. So how, how do I find my place in the story of God? Well, when we read this ancient story alongside stories like Sinai, along stories like the book of Acts, we can ask, how does an impoverished, embittered, spent, grieved, powerless woman like Naomi get into this vast, epic, immense story of God? Well, she gets in by bitterly complaining. And, and she's not alone in this. Naomi is not alone. Um, Job... I loathe my very life, therefore I give free reign to my complaint and speak out of my bitterness. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 20, one of my favorite lines. Speaking to God, this is a prayer. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me, and I was overpowered. Habakkuk, Jonah, I could go on and on. The Psalms, that ancient prayer book that the Jews used, this is how you learn how to pray 
And then the Christians, Jesus learned how to pray. If you, if you go through the Psalms, do you know what the most common type of Psalm is? Lament, grieving, complaining bitterly. 42 out of 150 Psalms are laments. So Psalm 142, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Psalm 13, how long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? Psalm 74, oh God, why have you rejected us? Psalm 22, the psalm that Jesus prayed on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 42 out of 150. One third of the psalms are psalms of lament. What does that tell you? Now, I'm not suggesting that real Christians hate life. Not suggesting that. The Apostle Paul, his life was a life of joy. And I'm not suggesting that the most spiritual prayers are complaints because there's 108 other types of psalms in there. Lots of other ways to pray. Lots of real expressions of spirituality, of relationship with God. And I'm not suggesting that blaming God or being angry at God is right or true. I'm just suggesting Shaddai has made my life very bitter. Yahweh has brought me back empty. Yahweh has afflicted me. Shaddai has brought misfortune upon me. I'm just saying, that's a biblical prayer. That's a biblical prayer. David, Jeremiah, Job, Naomi, they all pray like this. And rather than censor their prayers, God actually includes those prayers in his holy scriptures and teaches us to pray like that. A couple of years ago, I went through an emotionally healthy spirituality course because, you know, I thought this will be easy. I'm so emotionally healthy. This will be great. And then we got to the, the section on grief and loss. And they gave us an assignment. They said, okay, go off for 45 minutes, and you have to take this, this catalog of your life going through the years like 3 to 12, 13 to 18, 19 to 25, like uh, sections of your life, and you have to list your major disappointments, grief, loss from each period of your life, and then how you responded to it at the time. And up to that point, I didn't think of myself as a repressive person, but that was excruciatingly hard and really helpful. So, I don't know where you're at today. For some of you, this is going to sound really irrelevant. Like, you're like, what are you talking about? I don't have all this hurt in me. I'm so glad for you. Maybe you're not repressive like me. Wink, wink. But some of you can relate to Naomi. And I am so sorry. I don't want to put another burden on you. All I want to do is offer you the invitation that God gives us clearly in this text and throughout the scriptures. You can pour out your complaints to God. He can handle it. He's not going anywhere. In fact, this is not just Naomi's prayer. This is Jesus' prayer. That while I might not be able to understand what you're going through, he does. On the cross, he was cursed, rejected, lost, broken for you he entered into your grief your loss your pain so that you might get in on the story of God that what happened on the cross is that he chose to enter into your experience he chose to enter into your grief he chose to enter into your loss and we call that 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 choosing to do that we call that hesed he did it for you because of his love, his great love for you. And, and what happens when hesed at the cross enters into your life? Well, at first, nothing. But then three days later, he rose. So you can know whatever you're going through, he's not going anywhere. He is with you in this. He went to the cross to meet you there. You don't have to do it alone. He knows what you're going through. And he's crying out with you. So I don't know what's going to happen in your story, but I do know for Naomi, this begins something new. The the last verse, her bitter complaints start her on a new journey. 
The last verse of the chapter reads like this. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Dun, dun, dun. Let's pray. Father, I pray for us as a church that we would learn how to lament, how to pray our grief, how to, how to come to you, not, uh, not let our pain separate us from you, but to allow you to meet us in it, Lord. I pray that we would learn how to pray like Naomi. God, I, I pray for those who are in the midst of this right now that you would meet them where they're at and carry them through. I pray, Lord, that even now you'd be beginning new stories in our congregation and in our lives and pray this in Jesus' name.